I'm glad to be here. And uh, usually, you know, there was one, one year when Pastor Hiroshi asked me to preach in the Japanese service on the first Sunday of the year. And then the following year he said, I'm not going to let that happen again. I feel weird not preaching on the first Sunday of the year. <laughs> but uh, I could have, you know. <laughs> I'm just glad to see you here today. I, I didn't think we'd have this many since it is the first Sunday. I thought you'd all still be go gone somewhere. But I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad we can share uh, this fellowship time together. Man, thank you. Can we turn this down a little bit? A little bit too loud, I think. You can hear my snorting. <laughs> well, Chris always asks every year in November or December, what are you going to preach on next year, Kevin? And, you know, Hiroshi tells him, and this year he's going to preach on Colossians. And, and, uh, and I was thinking, well, I want to talk about the church. And I don't usually talk about topical issues. I usually go through a book myself, but... I felt like God was laying this on my heart, and uh, this is what we're going to look at today. Uh, a friend of mine who pastors in America did a survey in his church, and also he asked in the city uh, people at random what they thought about when they thought about the church. And inevitably, no matter who he asked, if he asked Protestants or Catholics, the word came out, building over and over again. People assume that he wanted to know about a building, a location. What do you think about when you think about the church? Oh, that, that building over there, or where I went when I was a child, where my parents took me, dropped me off, and went and did other things until the church service was over and then came and picked me up. So, a lot of people think about the church as a building. Well, the church is no more a building than a house is a family, right? The church is not a structure. It's something more than that. Jesus came to earth and he spent much of his time while here on earth, much of his three years of ministry was spent talking a lot about his church. And he taught his disciples about what to do and how to act and what to say in order to be the church. But he never described that church as a building. Jesus went through his ministry building the church, but they never built a physical structure. You read through the Gospels, you can find out a lot about what the church is, but you'll never see them talk or hear or read about them talking about any particular building. Now, Jesus did spend a lot of time in the temple area, and it was an important place to be, and a religious center. And buildings are important. Here, we are glad to have this beautiful building to worship in, aren't we? I'm glad to be inside. I don't like winter instead of outside somewhere doing this worship service. Actually, you know, Mitaki has three buildings, right? Did you know that? We have three buildings. We have this building, we have the building across the street, which is the Smile Kong, the House of Smiles. And we have one more. Maybe most of you don't know that. We have one more way up on the mountain over there. It's a pretty small building, but it houses the remains of saints who have gone on ahead. Now, all the saints that are members of this church, we take their remains and we go up there and we have a little ceremony. And it's the only building on Mitakiyama with a cross. And it's pretty obvious when you go up there. If you want to go sometime, let me know. We'll take you up there. We'll put on our hiking shoes and go. So buildings are important. It's important that we have buildings. We like this. We like the smile con. Ah, important building for us. We have a lot of fellowship there. We use it for church meetings and just fun things, right? It's important. But the church is not a building. You and I are the church. It's not a place where we go for an hour or two on Sunday. The church is where you are. We have many Bible studies throughout the city. 
And wherever you meet, wherever you get together, wherever you go, is where the church is. It's not where we are, but who we are. That's what the church is. It's about people. The church is people. People who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are the church. Jesus never described a building. Again, I want to reiterate that. He didn't talk about the temple being the place where people needed to go. As a matter of fact, when he talked to the Samaritan woman, he said, it's not about a building. We are the church. People who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus described his followers not as a building, but something like this. He said, you are the salt of the earth. As you read the Gospels, you can find these kinds of sayings. Jesus describing the church, his followers, people who have put their trust in him. He said, you are the light of the world. He didn't name a church. He didn't promise the Catholic Church or the Reformed Church or any church would be the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. He never talked about establishing a series of buildings or buildings around the world that would be lights in the world. He called his own disciples, his own followers, the light of the world. And he said, you, you believers, you followers, my children are the, follow, are the city set on a hill. You are to be that church, you and I. So, who is the founder of the church, we have to ask? And I've been telling you it's Jesus already. But just a little background on who I am. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. So, from the time I can remember going to catechism and going to church, I knew who the founder of the church was. Who, did you, who do you think that I thought it was? Peter, yeah. I thought it was St. Peter. I knew that when my Protestant friends, my, my aunt who was a, a Pentecostal Christian would come around, I would ask her, hey, what do you think about St. Peter? You know, like I knew anything. And she would go, Peter, yeah, he's in the Bible. She probably read her Bible dozens of times and could, you know, I, I had not even touched a Bible. But I really thought that it was Peter. There was no doubt about it. And there's a little bit of truth in that saying, right, in that that idea that Peter is the founder of the church because it did happen what Jesus said about the church a critical thing that he said about the church he said to Peter and so the Catholic Church believes this and then when I was about 18 and a half close to 19 I came to Japan and on my way to Japan I became a Christian a born-again believer and my idea about what the church was and when it was founded and who founded it changed. I began to hang out with some really excited, charismatic, Pentecostal kind of believers. They were people from all kinds of churches, but they were in one little place. They would meet in this little building we rented and they would praise God and sing and, you know, cry and talk about the day of Pentecost. And there was a big missionary who came from Fukuyama. He was about six foot eight or nine, something like that. Yeah, big giant guy. He'd come on a big motorcycle. And he'd disciple us. Yeah, big guy. You think he's big, you should see his sons. <laughs> his sons are giants. We have to move those doors when they come and visit. I mean, they're huge. They were Hiroshi's playmates, actually, when they were children. You must have looked kind of interesting hanging around with those big kids. He came to disciple us and he is a, an Assemblies of God missionary and he told me about the day of Pentecost in Acts 2-4 and, and the birth of the church. And so I assumed, not that he taught me specifically, that the church was founded by those Holy Spirit believers on that day. Now there's some important truths in that too, but I began to think later that that's not quite the whole truth. 
So I switched from Peter to the group of 120 Philip, uh, Pentecostal believe, uh, believers uh, on the day of Pentecost as being the founders of the church since they were filled at that activity. But in fact, Jesus Christ founded the church. And there is a problem with the Holy Spirit believers being responsible for the founding of the church because they're human. And there's, you know, as, as much as we want to live a godly life and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, there are times when we'll move away and do things that are not correct and are not godly and are not spirit-led. So it couldn't have been those early believers that were filled on the Holy, by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's look at uh, this text. It's not going to come up on the screen, so you're going to have to open up your Bible. To turn, turn with me to Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. So the Catholics talk a lot about these verses and, and use the, the Greek forms of these, the words in here to make their case for being... Uh, for Peter being the founder of the church, or at least the first pope. Verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, the, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or you are the Messiah, Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Barjona, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And upon this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Hmm. So, ah, upon this rock, right? Now, Protestants believe that on this rock is the confession of Peter that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that as Protestants. Well, Catholics said, believe that, you know, upon Peter I will build, upon you, Peter, upon the rock, Peter, or Rocky. Hey, Rocky, I'm going to build my church on you. I don't think what, that's what Jesus was saying. But what did Jesus say? And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is going to do it. Peter didn't do it. The early spirit-filled believers didn't do it. It had already been begun. Jesus was establishing his church right here in Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> okay, come on. The church was built by our great shepherd, Jesus Christ. It was founded by him. It was what he did. And how did he do it? We just took uh, the Lord's Supper. We remembered. And Jesus did it through his life of ministry here on earth. But he also did it by laying his life down for us. And he laid his, down, his life down. Why I put the scripture up about him being the shepherd? Because we are his sheep. He laid down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd will do that. And he did that. He willingly went to the cross for us. He died for us knowing who we were, knowing how bad we are, knowing that we would ignore his gift. He still did it. He willingly laid down his life for his sheep. That is... For his church. We are his church. You and I as believers, we are his flock, and we are his church. It's what you and I do. It's who we are. It's what we saw in the video that Michelle showed us. We are his church. We are the hands. We are the feet. We are the voice of Jesus. Now that he is gone, the Holy Spirit of the Spirit of Christ is living in us. 
Now, you know, I'm, I take a, it's kind of dangerous to say this, but if I was Jesus, I wouldn't have started the church the way Jesus did. I wouldn't have started it with the group of people Jesus did. I think I'd have gone, there was a lot of religious activity going on when Jesus came to earth. There are a lot of religious schools, a lot of seminaries, a lot of Bible colleges around the Jerusalem area, around, all around Israel. Now, if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have gone and hung out by the doors of those seminaries. I had been talking to people saying, hey, who's the, who's the guy? Who's, you know, who's the student with the best grades? I mean, who do you know that prays the most? I'd have been looking for real spiritual kind of religious people. But that's not what Jesus did. Thank goodness he didn't do it that way. Jesus didn't choose seminary graduates to be his first disciples. Are seminary graduates important? Pastor Hiroshi says, yeah, I teach in Tokyo. We have a Bible college in Tokyo. I'm a graduate of a Bible college. Pastor Hiroshi is a graduate of a couple of them. Seminaries are important. But that's not who Jesus, Jesus chose. He chose ordinary, flawed, messed up people to be his first evangelists, first pastors, first elders. Everything that Jesus taught was given to ordinary, everyday, messed up people, just like you and I. <laughs> Who did he choose? Fishermen. A tax collector. He chose the most despised people, the most despised person by the Jewish people, one of them, to be one of his top disciples, I think top because he wrote the book of Matthew. And what's on the other extreme of that, he chose Simon the Zealot. Now what is a zealot? A zealot is a little knife, a curved knife that had one purpose, to be used in assassinations and slicing people's throats. A zealot was a terrorist, basically. So you have this guy, Simon the Zealot, a terrorist who hated the Romans, and you've got Matthew, the tax collector, who is siding with the Romans. Can you imagine these two guys following Jesus around and Jesus making them bunk together? Pretty interesting, huh? It'd be like, you know, getting a Southern Baptist and a Pentecostal to bunk together or something, you know? Could have been some interesting conversations going on there. But as the church grew, the diversity grew even more. Jesus didn't choose any women in his first 12. I think the logistics of that wouldn't have worked. I mean, they were camping around the countryside, sleeping outdoors, and there'd have been issues with that. But as time grew, women became more involved in the uh, activities of the church. Priests began to be saved. That probably some of the priests that when Jesus was on earth, he had witnessed to, he had preached to, had heard him preach. If you read through the book of Acts, you can find a lot of diversity happening. It kind of probably looked a lot like Mitaki's international service, the early church. A lot of diversity here. Look around. See anybody that looks like you? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> That's good. This is what it's going to be like in heaven, so get used to it. Now, what does it mean to be the church? Well, I think today's text, you can see it in your bulletin, or you can look up here. I'm going to put it up here in a little bit. Paul mentioned a very important believer named Phoebe. She's only mentioned right in this text in Scripture. I think Phoebe can help us to understand what it means to be the church. Or the text in these two verses can do a lot to help us understand what it means to be the church. Let's turn to, you can turn or you can just look up here. And I've used uh, 
a, a version different that you, that you have here, but the one in the bulletin talks about the words, instead of saints, the worthy of the believers or something to that effect, but let me read it. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in St. Crea. I ask you, church at Rome, to receive her in the Lord. This is Paul writing. In a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Quite a recommendation from Paul for this female Gentile believer. Keep that in mind. Paul is a Jew. And he's writing to the church in Rome. I commend to you our sister, our Gentile sister Phoebe. <laughs> Very interesting. I commend to you our sister. Our sister. What does it mean to be the church? I think we're not all sisters. We're brothers and sisters and moms and dad in Christ. But we're all siblings. We're all part of the family of God. And that's what Paul is saying. I commend to you church at Rome. One of our family members. This young lady named Phoebe. She's our sister. We're all part of the family of God here, so I commend her to you. I know her. Isn't it good to be part of the family of God? I love being part of the family of God. I've been saved for many years, and I can tell you that as a young Marine, I went all over the world, and I missed my brothers and sisters from home back in Louisiana. But I could pick up a phone book at a bus station in North Carolina, choose a church, and say, hey, I'm at the bus station. I've got a couple hours before I ride out to the airport and catch my flight. Can you come and pick me up? Oh, man, we'll be there. And they would come and get me, and I would go, and there was worship, and there was hugging, and there was handshaking, and it was just like family. When you are in pain, isn't it good to have somebody to share that pain with you? To give you just a little comfort. I don't know what to say, but I'll hold your hand. I don't know how to help you out of this struggle. But please know that I'll be praying for you. I'm going to pray for you right now. That's what it is to be the church. That's what the church does. The church gives of their time, of their energy, because we're family. I have a younger brother that I'm close to in Louisiana, and we share stuff. We've always shared stuff, and I've never ever thought, hey, I'm sending you some, some snacks from Japan, and the receipt is in the box. <laughs> I just send them to it. We give, we share. But of course, he, he wouldn't pay me for, you know, dried fish and stuff like that anyway. Here's the neat part about being part of the family of God. This is so good. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us, you and I, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of me. When I was growing up, I had this big brother, and he was a wrestler, and he had big muscles, and I was about this big. You don't believe that, but it's true. I was really skinny, and I, I was weak, but I always tried to act like I was tough, you know. So when I'd go somewhere with my little brother, I mean my big brother, you know, he'd kind of stand in front of me, you know. He didn't want his buddies to see me, you know. I'd say, hey, Bobby, Bobby, tell me, introduce me to your friend. Bobby would go, oh, I'm my own brother. Get back there. He was ashamed of me. His brothers were tough guys and wrestlers. I was a little skinny wimp. He was ashamed of his own brother. Jesus is not ashamed of us. He's glad to introduce us to our Heavenly Father. And He does often as He intercedes for us. Ah, Kevin sinned again. Yeah, but Dad, I died for Kevin. 
I'm not ashamed to say it. He's mine. He trusts me. Not ashamed of him at all. Jesus is not ashamed of us. And that's what it should be like in the family of God. We should be this family that lives together, trusts one another, and is not ashamed to say, yes, this is my brother. As the church, this is how we're to behave. This is just a few of the scriptures in the New Testament that tells us how to behave toward one another as family members. Look at this list. Love one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another. You can't honor someone if you're ashamed of them. <laughs> Live in harmony with one another. Accept one another. Teach one another. That's what we have to be careful with, right? Teaching one another doesn't mean, hey, come here, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And cramming your doctrine down their throat. It's kind of hard for somebody to say thank you when you've got... <laughs> Teach one another and the next one, be kind and compassionate to one another, should go together. So when you're teaching someone who's not necessarily, you know, in your, in your Bible studies or here, you need to do it with grace, with lots of grace. And that's what it is. Be kind, be compassionate to the one you're teaching. This is how we're to behave. One and there's so many more. Read through the letters of Paul and you'll find out what it is. Now, let's, let's go on. Receive Phoebe, receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints. Receive Phoebe as a saint just as you are a saint. Receive her that way. She's a saint. She's a woman. She's a Gentile. There are a lot of Jewish Christians in the Church of Rome, I know. But she is a saint. Receive her that way. Just like you'd receive any saint. Just like you receive me, Paul is saying. Now, what is a saint? <laughs> wow. Coming from a Roman Catholic background, I just had to think about this and I wanted to share some thoughts about what the Catholic Church standards are for becoming a saint. And there's, there's some good in this too because some people we think are, you know, are saintly, maybe in the long run are, are not quite what we think. But I, I printed out a list of uh, what the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church thinks or their standard for becoming a saint. Some people say uh, there are three steps, but there are actually four according to this printout here. Before a person be can be considered for sainthood, he or she must have been dead for at least five years. Well, okay, that rules out Phoebe and me and you and everybody else here. But Pope Paul, Pope John Paul II waived this rule in the case of Mother Teresa and still they're considering her case, apparently. First step, well, if you're, um, you're dead, let's say you're dead, and then we go to the first step. When the subject arises that a person should be considered for sainthood, a bishop is placed in charge of the in initial investigation of the person's life, past life, you know, they're dead, so. It is, if it is determined that the candidate is deemed worthy of further consideration, the Vatican grant, grants a nihil obstat. That is a Latin phrase that means nothing hinders. Henceforth, the candidate is called a servant of God. Step two. The church official, a postulator who coordinates the process and serves as an advocate, must prove that the candidate lived heroic virtues. This is archived through the collection of documents and testimonies that are collected and presented to the congregation for the causes of saints in Rome. That's a, an organization, the causes of saints in Rome. When the candidate is approved, he or she earns the title of vener venerable. Venerable. Venerable is a word that means very worthy. Worthy of great respect and honor. Step three, to be beatified and recognized as blessed, one miracle, 
one miracle acquired through the candidate's intercession is required in addition to recognition of heroic virtue or martyrdom in the case of a martyr. So that would, that would kind of replace the miracle. If you were martyred, that's good enough. And so you got killed for your faith and we'll waive the, the miracle thing. And the fourth step, I don't quite understand how a second miracle, but you, you've become beatified. So you're up there with Pastor Chris and Pastor Hiroshi, you know. And, <laughs> and now they say, yep, they made it up to here. Now we've got to do a little more digging. Canonization requires a second miracle. So they have to do some more research and, and hope that there was another miracle. Unless maybe a relic? I don't know how they would have a second miracle because they're dead after beatification, though a pope may waive these requirements. A miracle is not required prior to a martyr's beatification, but one is required before his or her canonization. Canonization means, yes, you are a saint. Once this second miracle has been verified or received through their intercession, the pope declares them a saint. Whew. Huh. Tough standards for becoming a saint. But Paul said that Phoebe should re be received as a saint. She is a saint, he's saying. Maybe she did some miracles. Yeah, she certainly did some good things. The Bible says that any believer in Christ is a saint. Any believer. You and I are saints. Don't wait to believe that you're a saint. You're a saint. You're a person who has been set apart, sanctified by the Holy Spirit living in you. It's already happened. You're being sanctified, I think. And my idea is that you're always being sanctified. You're growing as you grow in Christ to be sanctified to be a saint means it's an ongoing process. We're being changed into the image of Christ daily. So the sanctification process continues. So we're saints. But we often think, we must ask ourselves, is my behavior saint-like? I'm, I'm not talking about scripture saying, well, a saint has to behave this way. I'm just saying that we, what we normally feel. Do you feel saint-like most of the time? I, I want to feel that way. I want to believe that I'm living a godly life, a saint-like lifestyle, but I don't always. So how does it happen? How do I represent the church? I am the church, so shouldn't I be saintly in my behavior? By the way, I'm from Louisiana, and the New Orleans Saints won today. Just want to let you know that here. Okay. Is that saint-like behavior? I don't know. The saints are struggling this year, but they're, they made it one level up. So, How do we do that? How do we become more saint-like? It's, it's not like some kind of great effort. It's by staying in God's Word. It's by praying. It's by serving. It's by just becoming more and more like Christ, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And I mentioned reading the Bible, and I know nobody's having trouble reading the Bible because it's January. Everybody reads the Bible in January. I bet you're part, part way through Genesis already. Where will you be next week? <laughs> I bet the Bible is most read in the first week of January, every year. I bet our spirituality grows by leaps and bounds in January. And then what happens? All right. Phoebe, a servant in the church. The, the bulletin you have, Jim took the bulletin right out of Bible Gateway, which uses the modern version of uh, the NIV, the most current version of the NIV. And it, it talks about uh, Phoebe as a deacon in the church. Well, the, the Greek word is diakonos. Did I say that right? Okay, diakonos, which is where we get our word deacon. Thank you. Greek speaker back there. Two Greek speakers. So it's, it's correct. 
But what does diakonos mean? How do we translate it throughout the New Testament? Uh, depending on the situation, it's translated deacon or minister or servant. And some of, sometimes those are all interchangeable depending on what they do. If you're a pastor of a church, you know that you do everything. Right? Pastor Hiroshi preaches and teaches and cleans the floor and fixes the toilet. And I mean, I, I came to church once and I saw his feet sticking out of the woman's toilet. He was laying on the floor. And I ran and said, are you okay? I'm going to get something wrong with the toilet here. <laughs> Ministers. He serves. And this is what Phoebe does. This is what Phoebe did. I don't know if she held a position as we have in churches as a, a deacon or as if she was actually a minister or an evangelist and, and Paul gave her that word. I don't know that. I kind of tend to believe a certain way, but that's not for this moment. But whatever she was doing so impressed Paul that he commended her. He encouraged the church at Rome to give her whatever she needed. This lady is doing such great things for the body of Christ. I want you to take care of her. And Paul was the leader of the church at the time. Paul was well known when he wrote the book of Romans. So people listened when Paul wrote. Phoebe is such a help to the body of Christ. Don't ignore her needs. Because she has been a great help to many, including me. What was Phoebe doing? Phoebe was being the church. She was serving in whatever way she could. Again, it must have impressed Paul, her life of service, for him to say, to take these two verses out of this opening chapter in Romans to recommend her to the church. That was, it was a growing church, an important church, to say, by the way, my sister Phoebe, our sister Phoebe, a saint just like you and I are coming, and I want you to take care of her. It's important you meet all of her needs. Why? Because Phoebe was being the church. This is what should be happening in the church today. People should be saying that about us. We should be behaving as Phoebe did. People should say, hey, my friend's coming to Tokyo next week. I want you to take care of him. I want you to take care of her. She's been a great help. He's been a great help to us here at Mitaki. You take care of them up there when they get there, okay? Are you and I, are we being the church today? Are we serving one another? Are we helping those amongst, among us with needs? Whether they're emotional needs, physical needs, financial needs, a place to stay, a car to take them somewhere. Are we serving those believers in our body with our abundance. This has happened quite a few times, but I read about a church in San Diego, San Diego County, I think, that uh, 7,000 members in this church. The pastor said they had church, they had church services on Saturday and Sunday. So the seventh, the big church, big population, and he said. In a few weeks, we're going to have a weekend where there will be no church services here. Instead, we're going to go out, go throughout the county of San Diego and meet the needs of the community. Whatever they are, whatever talents we have in this body, we're going to employ them in the community and we're going to go out and serve the community. Out of those 7,000 members, 5,500 of them showed up for community service. Do you think they made an impact on the community? Fixing cars, repairing homes, picking up trash, whatever they could do to serve is what they did. They were being the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ. That's the church. It made an impact. Now, I'd miss church on Sunday, but wow. Now, let's just review. Jesus founded his church. It wasn't founded by anyone else. He established it. 
You and I are His church. We are the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of us are you know, a little bit up there. We can be spiritual dads and moms to some of our younger believers here who are hurting. People away from home need a little bit of dad and mom fellowship. Should be willing to do that. We are His saints. The Spirit of Christ is working in us and changing us. What is, what is the Spirit of Christ changing us into? The very image of Jesus Christ. We're not there yet. We're saved from the moment we say yes to Jesus Christ. But do we look like Jesus? If, if it was possible that Jesus Christ could live in my body for a day, replace my heart, my emotions with His, what would the neighborhood see? They'd see Kevin walking around a lot different. <laughs> they would see Jesus. I would just sit back and watch. Oh man, I'm falling short big time. But that's what we are striving to be like. That's who we are striving to be like. We want to be like Jesus. And that's the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us. We are saints, but we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And our last point, we are His servants created in Him to do good works. We are created to serve those around us. It's what it means to be the church. Let's pray.